Section 5 of An American Tragedy, Volume 1, by Theodore Dreiser. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. Read by Tatiana Chichilla. Book 1, Chapter 5. The imaginative flights of Clyde in connection with all this, his dreams of what it might mean for him to be connected with so glorious an institution, can only be suggested. For his ideas of luxury were in the main so extreme and mistaken and gauche, mere wanderings of a repressed and unsatisfied fancy, which as yet had had nothing but imaginings to feed it. He went back to his old duties at the drug store, to his home after hours in order to eat and sleep, but for now the balance of this Friday and Saturday and Sunday and Monday until late in the day, he walked on air, really. His mind was not on what he was doing, and several times his superior at the drug store had to remind him to wake up. And after hours, instead of going directly home, he walked north to the corner of 14th and Baltimore, where stood this great hotel, and looked at it. There, at midnight even, before each of the three principal entrances, one facing each of three streets, was a doorman in a long maroon coat with many buttons and a high-rimmed and long-visored maroon cap, and inside, behind a looped and fluted French silk curtain, were the still blazing lights, the a la carte dining room, and the American grill in the basement near one corner still open and about them were many taxis and cars, and there was music always, from somewhere. After surveying it all this Friday night and again on Saturday and Sunday morning, he returned on Monday afternoon at the suggestion of Mr. Squires, and was greeted by that individual rather crustily, for by then he had all but forgotten him. But seeing that at the moment he was actually in need of help, and being satisfied that Clyde might be of service, he led him to his small office under the stair, where, with a very superior manner and much actual indifference, he proceeded to question him as to his parentage, where he lived, at what he had worked before and where, what his father did for a living, a poser that for Clyde, for he was proud and so ashamed to admit that his parents conducted a mission and preached on the streets. Instead, he replied, which was true at times, that his father canvassed for a washing machine and ringer company, and on Sundays preached, a religious revelation which was not at all displeasing to this master of boys who were inclined to be anything but home-loving and conservative. Could he bring a reference from where he now was? He could. Mr. Squires proceeded to explain that this hotel was very strict. Too many boys, on account of the scenes and the show here, the contact with undue luxury to which they were not accustomed, though these were not the words used by Mr. Squires, were inclined to lose their heads and go wrong. He was constantly being forced to discharge boys who, because they had made a little extra money, didn't know how to conduct themselves. He must have boys who are willing, civil, prompt, courteous to everybody. They must be clean and neat about their persons and clothes, and show up promptly, on the dot, and in good condition for the work every day. And any boy who got to thinking that because he made a little money, he could flirt with anybody or talk back, or go off on parties late at night, and then not show up on time, or too tired to be quick and bright, needn't think that he would be there long. He would be fired, and that promptly. He would not tolerate any nonsense. That must be understood now, once and for all. Clyde nodded assent often and interpolated a few eager, yes sirs, and no sirs, and assured him at the last that it was the furthest thing from his thoughts and temperament to dream of any such high crimes and misdemeanors as he had outlined. Mr. Squires then proceeded to explain that this hotel only paid fifteen dollars a month and board, at the servants' table in the basement, to any dull boy at any time. But, and this information came as a most amazing revelation to Clyde, every guest for whom any of the boys did anything, carried a bag or delivered a pitcher of water or did anything, gave him a tip, and often a quite liberal one, a dime, fifteen cents, a quarter, sometimes more. And these tips, as Mr. Squires explained, taken all together, averaged from four to six dollars a day, not less, and sometimes more. Most amazing pay, as Clyde now realized. His heart gave an enormous bound and was near to suffocating him at the mere mention of so large a sum. From four to six dollars? Why, that was twenty-eight to forty-two dollars a week. He could scarcely believe it, and that in addition to the fifteen dollars a month and board. And there was no charge, as Mr. Squires now explained, for the handsome uniforms the boys wore, but it might not be worn or taken out of the place. His hours, as Mr. Squires now proceeded to explain, would be as follows. On Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, and Sundays, he was to work from six in the morning until noon, and then, with six hours off, from six in the evening until midnight. 
On Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, he need only work from noon until six, thus giving him each alternate afternoon or evening to himself. But all his meals were to be taken outside his working hours, and he was to report promptly in uniform for lineup and inspection by his superior exactly ten minutes before the regular hours of his work began at each watch. As for some other things which were in his mind at the time, Mr. Squire said nothing. There were others, as he knew, who would speak for him. Instead, he went on to add, and then quite climactically for Clyde at that time, who had been sitting as one in a daze, "'I suppose you are ready to go to work now, aren't you?' "'Yes, sir. Yes, sir,' he replied. "'Very good.' Then he got up and opened the door which had shut them in. "'Oscar,' he called to a boy seated at the head of the bellboy bench, to which a tallish, rather oversized youth in a tight, neat-looking uniform responded with alacrity, "'Take this young man here. Clyde Griffiths is your name, isn't it? Up to the wardrobe on Twelfth and see if Jacobs can find a suit to fit. But if he can't, tell him to alter it by tomorrow. I think the one Silsby wore ought to be about right for him.' Then he turned to his assistant at the desk, who was at the moment looking on. "'I'm giving him a trial, anyhow,' he commented. "'Have one of the boys coach him a little tonight or whenever he starts in. "'Go ahead, Oscar,' he called to the boy in charge of Clyde. "'He's green at this stuff, but I think he'll do,' he added to his assistant, as Clyde and Oscar disappeared in the direction of one of the elevators. Then he walked off to have Clyde's name entered upon the payroll. In the meantime, Clyde, in tow of his new mentor, was listening to a line of information such as never previously had come to his ears anywhere. "'You needn't be frightened if you ain't never worked at anything like this before,' began this youth, whose last name was Hegland, as Clyde later learned, and who hailed from Jersey City, New Jersey, exotic lingo, gestures, and all. He was tall, vigorous, sandy-haired, freckled, genial, and voluble. They had entered upon an elevator labeled employees. "'It ain't so hard.' I got my first job in Buffalo three years ago, and I never knowed a thing about it up to that time. All you gotta do is to watch the others and see how they do, see? You get that, do you? Clyde, whose education was not a little superior to that of his guide, commented quite sharply in his own mind on the use of such words as node and gotta, also upon ting, dat, utters, and so on, but was so grateful for any courtesy at this time that he was inclined to forgive his obviously kindly mentor anything for his geniality. Watch whoever's doing anything at first, see, till you get to know, see, that's the way. When the bell rings, if you're at the head of the bench, it's your turn, see, and you jump up and go quick. They like you'd be quick round here, see, and whenever you see anyone come to the door or out of an elevator with a bag, and you're at the head of the bench, you jump, whether the captain rings the bell or calls front or not. Sometimes he's busy or ain't looking, and he wants you to do that, see? Look sharp, because if you don't get no bags, you don't get no tips, see? Everybody that has a bag or anything has to have it carried for him, unless they won't let you have it, see? But be sure and wait somewhere near the desk for whoever comes in until they sign up for a room, he rattled on as they ascended in the elevator. Most everyone takes a room. Then the clerk will give you the key, and after that, all you gotta do is carry up the bags to the room. Then all you gotta do is turn on the lights in the bathroom and closet, if there is one, so they'll know where they are, see? And then raise the curtains in the daytime or lower them at night, and see if there's towels in the room so you can tell the maid if there ain't. And then if they don't give no tip, you gotta go. Only most times, unless you draw stiff, all you gotta do is hang back a little. Make a stall, see? Fumble with the door key or try to transom, see? Then if they're any good, they'll hand you a tip. If they don't, you're out, that's all, see? You can't even look as though you were sore, though. Nothing like that, see? Then you come down, and unless they wants ice water or something, you're true, see? It's back to the bench, quick. There ain't much to it. Only you gotta be quick all the time, see? And not let anyone get by you coming or going. That's the main thing. And after they give you your uniform and you go to work, don't forget to give the captain a dollar after every watch before you leave, see? Two dollars on the day you has two watches, and a dollar on the day you has one, see? That's the way it is here. We work together like that, and here you gotta do that if you want to hold your job. But that's all. After that, all the rest is yours. Clyde saw. A part of his twenty-four or thirty-two dollars, as he figured it, was going glimmering, apparently, eleven or twelve all told, but what of it? Would there not be twelve, or fifteen, or even more left? And there were his meals and his uniform. Kind heaven, what a realization of paradise! What a consummation of luxury! Mr. Hegland of Jersey City escorted him to the twelfth floor, and into a room where they found on guard a wizened and grizzled little old man of doubtful age and temperament, who forthwith outfitted Clyde with a suit that was so near a fit that without further orders it was not deemed necessary to alter it, and trying on various caps, there was one that fitted him, a thing that sat most rakishly over one ear, only, as Hegland informed him, 
You'll have to get that hair of yours cut. Better get it clipped behind. It's too long. And with that, Clyde himself had been in mental agreement before he spoke. His hair certainly did not look right in the new cap. He hated it now. And going downstairs and reporting to Mr. Whipple, Mr. Squire's assistant, the latter had said, Very well. It fits all right, does it? Well, then, you go on here at six. Report at 5.30 and be here in your uniform at 5.45 for inspection. Whereupon Clyde, being advised by Heglin to go then and there to get his uniform and take it to the dressing room in the basement and get his locker from the locker man, he did so, and then hurried most nervously out, first to get a haircut and afterwards to report to his family on his great luck. He was to be a bellboy in the great Hotel Green Davidson. He was to wear a uniform and a handsome one. He was to make, but he did not tell his mother at first what he was to make truly, but more than eleven or twelve at first, anyhow, he guessed. He could not be sure. For now, all at once, he saw economic independence ahead for himself, if not for his family, and he did not care to complicate it with any claims which a confession as to his real salary would most certainly inspire. But he did say that he was to have his meals free, because that meant eating away from home, which was what he wished. And in addition, he was to live and move always in the glorious atmosphere of this hotel, not to have to go home ever before twelve, if he did not wish, to have good clothes, interesting company maybe a good time gee and as he hurried on about his various errands now it occurred to him as a final and shrewd and delicious thought that he need not go home on such nights as he wished to go to the theater or anything like that he could just stay downtown and say he had to work and that with free meals and good clothes think of that the mere thought of all this was so astonishing and entrancing that he could not bring himself to think of it too much he must wait and see he must wait and see just how much he would make here in this perfectly marvelous, marvelous realm. End of Book 1, Chapter 5